In the previous lecture, we have shown the equivalence of a Gaussian dropout with a special kind of uh, variational Bayesian inference. So, uh, we have proved that uh, Gaussian dropout really optimizes uh, the following elbow. And uh, in this elbow, the second term doesn't depend on theta, so it can be ignored uh, if we optimize only with respect to, th to theta. And now the question is, why not to optimize both with respect to theta and alpha? Because remember that uh, our variational approximation, our Q, uh, of W depends on theta and uh, and also of alpha. And remember that uh, the more variational parameters we have, the closer we are to the true posterior distribution. So we may only uh, get our approximation better and better. So then, uh, why not optimize uh, alpha with respect to theta and alpha? Uh, it is important to know that uh, it was not possible until we came with a Bayesian interpretation of Gaussian dropout. Really. If we try to optimize uh, with, uh, just the first term, the data term, with respect to both theta and alpha, we would quickly end up with the zero values of alpha. Why so? Because uh, we know that uh, the, first, uh, the, the maximum value of the first term is achieved when uh, our distribution is delta function at WML. And delta function means zero variance, and zero variance means zero alpha. So we may uh, obtain some non-zero values of alpha only if we optimize both terms, the data term and our regularizer. So now our variation approximation uh, looks uh, as follows. So this is fully factorized uh, Gaussian uh, distribution with respect to all weights wij with the mean theta ij and with variance alpha theta ij squared. But we may go even further. Why not to assign individual dropout rate to each weight? Why not to, to say that uh, our variation approximation looks as follows? So this is fully factorized Gaussian distribution over wij with the mean theta ij and with variance alpha ij times theta ij squared. So we may now assign individual dropout rate, individual alpha to each of the weights. And again, uh, this, this will make our approximation only tighter. We only uh, come closer to the true posterior distribution. But before we proceed, uh, let us examine the properties of our, our regularizer, its dependence with, uh, on alpha. Uh, we remember that we may approximate it with a smooth differentiable function, and we see that the maximum value of this regularizer is achieved when alpha goes to plus infinity. This means that the second term of our alpha encourages uh, larger values of alphas. And that's quite interesting, because uh, we may easily prove that if alpha j goes to plus infinity, then the corresponding theta j, this is the mean in our variation approximation, converges to zero, in such a way that alpha ij times uh, theta ij squared uh, also converges to zero. But this means that uh, our variational approximation, uh, our q w i j, uh, becomes delta function when alpha ij goes to plus infinity. And delta, uh, delta function centered at zero. And delta function centered at zero means that the corresponding w i j is exactly zero. And this means that we may simply skip this connection, simply remove the corresponding weight from our neural network, thus effectively sparsifying it. So, uh, the whole procedure, which is known as sparse variational dropout, uh, looks as follows. First, we assign a log uniform prior distribution over the weights. This is fully factorized prior distribution. Then we fix variational family of distributions, Q of W given theta alpha. And again, it is fully factorized distribution over all weights, wij with a mean theta ij and with variance given by alpha ij times uh, theta ij squared. And finally, we perform a stochastic variational inference, trying to optimize our alpha both with respect to thetas and with respect to all alphas. And at the end, we remove all weights whose alphas exceeded some predefined large threshold. And surprisingly, this procedure works quite well. So on this picture you see uh, the behavior of uh, convolution kernels uh, from convolutional layers and uh, the fragment of weight matrix from fully connected layers. So you see that uh, as training progresses, the more and more weights and the more and more uh, coefficients in convolution kernels converge to zero. Uh, the compression factor exceeds uh, 200. And uh, pay attention that the accuracy uh, doesn't decrease. So by keeping the same accuracy, uh, this is the baseline, uh, while effectively compressing the, uh, the whole network in uh, uh, hundreds of times. This only became possible due to this uh, Bayesian uh, dropout. So to conclude, uh, it is known that uh, modern deep architectures uh, are very redundant, but it is quite problematic to remove this redundancy. 
And one of the most successful ways to do this is a Bayesian dropout or a sparse variation of dropout. Variational Bayesian inference is a highly scalable procedure uh, that allows to optimize millions of variational parameters. And this is just one of many examples of successful combination of Bayesian methods and deep learning. More examples of successful application of Bayesian methods to DNNs you may find in additional reading material list.